the Bible. So we're having an open book test on these questions so we can get them all right. Right, Tamia? Tamika promised to be nice today. So welcome to the service. While we're waiting, let's see who can finish these Bible verses about love. Bible verses about love. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect delight, unity, sync, or reason. What do you say? Unity. I hear unity. Anybody with any other answers? They said unity. Unity must be the right answer. Mother Lee said unity, and it is correct. One for one. Whoever does not love does not blank God because God is love. They don't know God. They don't see God. They don't love God. They don't feel God or all of the above. <laughs> okay, I hear A. Is there any other answers? A, they don't know God if they don't love. And the correct answer, two for two, two for two. Hey, hey. Tamika, I'm taking you to Chick-fil-A Sunday. A new blank I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. A new suggestion, directive, command, or blog post. See, is a command, it's not a suggestion, y'all. Not a suggestion, it's a command that we love one another. Amen? C is correct, three for three. Hatred stirs up conflict. But love cover over, covers over all blank annoyances, selfishness, teamwork, or wrongs. I think wrong is another word for sin. Okay, we say wrongs, Tamika. Four for four. Four for four. <laughs> we doing good. I think we all going to Chick-fil-A at Tamika's expense. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is faith, hope, love, or all of them. C, love, we say love. Five for five, hey, we confident in this thing. Five for five, the greatest is love. First Corinthians 13, 13. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the blank of God, the friends of God, the children of God, the co-workers of God, or the employees of God. Children, children has it. We say the children, six for six. We batting a thousand. Tamika, get your credit card ready. You're going to treat us all. Six for six, children of God. But love your blank. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Love your friends, love your family, love your countrymen, or love your enemies. Everybody said D, your enemies. Six for six. Six for six. Six for six. Hey. <laughs> All right. Whoever would foster love covers over in blank. But whoever repeats the matter separate close friends. You foster annoyance, you foster offense, you foster enigma or awkward situation. I hear offense, I hear offense. Do I hear anything else? They said offense, and it's right again. Tamika is... And we know that in all things, God's work for the blank of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. My favorite scripture. For the good CC is correct. What is that, eight for eight? For the good. We're doing great, we're doing great. Romans 8, 28. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made blank in us. Alive, real, awake, or complete. I don't know what translation you're using, but I guess complete is the same as perfect. 
So we're gonna say D. We're gonna say D. Hey, nine for nine. Get your credit card ready, Tamika. <laughs> oh, we did 10 for 10. Thanks for playing. How many did you get right? Did anybody get all 10 right? Yeah, we, we got this one. We nailed that one. Let us stand for worship. Good morning, good morning, good morning. If you could just take a second to look back and remember who and what and when somebody prayed for you. I'm so glad they prayed. I'm so glad they prayed. I'm so glad they prayed for me. Somebody prayed for me, had me on their mind. Took a little time and prayed for me. Oh, I'm so glad they prayed. I'm so glad they prayed. I'm so glad they prayed for me. Preacher, preacher, pray for me. Had me on his mind. Took a little time and prayed for me. and tell them I'm so glad they prayed. I'm so glad they prayed. Hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Well, just in case some of you have not figured it out yet, PK is not here. <laughs> don't leave, don't lock the doors, lock the doors, don't nobody leave, because uh, he did leave someone to step in the shoes, and we thank God that he and First Lady or somewhere getting some absolutely much deserved, much needed rest. And we're happy that he listened to the spirit to take some time off. So we're gonna just carry on and uh, do what thus saith the Lord, amen? Can somebody tell me what the theme is for this year? What's the theme for the year? Wow, y'all the smart crowd. Maturing like the master. And in, in our lesson, we're going to find out that that's some of what we need to be doing. Somebody know the memory verse, the address, and what it says?
Hallelujah. Luke 252. Praise God. And our key phrase for this year is all right, oh, this is a smart crowd, Pastor. They know this. They are with the vision. They say, don't just go for it, grow for it. Hallelujah. We thank God for this. And today's lesson is prioritizing hurting people. Let us pray. Father God, we come before your throne with thanksgiving. We come into your courts with praise, oh God. Thanking you and praising you for this opportunity to have a study in your word. And Father, we just pray that you will take over and that you will be the teacher. I'll step aside and you have your way, oh God. And let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be only that which is acceptable in your sight. And Father, we pray for our pastor and first lady as they're getting that rest, oh God, that you will give them good times, that you will give them plenty of rest. They'll come back refreshed and ready to go forward to do your will, oh God. And all these blessings in Jesus' name we pray and we thank you. Amen, amen, amen. Uh, we're talking about prioritizing hurting people. What does that mean to you? Rana, Rana. What does that mean to you when you say prioritizing hurting people? I hear putting hurting people first, prioritizing. What does that look like? People are hurting and that we are there as Christians to encourage them, to lift them up and to pray for them. So we prioritize them, not before Christ, but we lift them up because they are hurting. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Prioritizing hurting people. Listening to the command that Jesus gave us to love one another. So being able to love others, even if no matter what they're going through or who they are. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Prioritizing hurting people. I've got somebody over here with a hand. Yes, I do need it. John, don't fall down. Uh, the word prioritize, <laughs> meaning making it first, making it a priority, making a Making the person that you know who needs prayer, let them be first in your, on your prayer list. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you. As I was studying this lesson, something that came to my mind is how some of us will get a new car, still smell the leather inside of it, real nice car, and we're on our way to church. It's raining outside. And we see a sister or brother from church walking in the rain. And we have this mindset that, oh, no, I'm not picking them up because they're going to get my car dirty. They're going to bring in the rain or whatever. So we value that car more than we do people. This lesson is teaching us that we need to prioritize people. We need to love people and use things rather than using people and loving things. We need to prioritize hurting people. Anybody know anybody that's hurting? Do you know, have not a, anybody hurting? Only a few of you. By the end of this lesson, I hope that we'll get the vision to realize there's a lot of hurting people out there and we need to be on our post to do what we need to do to help these people, amen? Let us read our introduction together. Romans 12, 13 reads, Share with God's people who needs help. This verse records practical advice on Christian living from Apostle Paul's life. Life is filled with individuals who have been labeled as lost, least, and left out. However, it is important for believers to show care and compassion to people from all walks of life. This lesson is designed to share elements for prioritizing hurting people. That's Romans 12 and 13 that say, share with God's people who needs help. And we find people all over the place in our own family. A lot of times people fall down and people have problems. Sometimes it's due to their own fault for bad choices. And sometimes it's to due to no fault of their own. And as we go through this lesson talking about Mephibosheth, we're going to find out how sometimes people can just be dropped and, and hurting and it's no fault of their own. Amen? 
Let us look at the breakdown of 2 Samuel chapter 9. The first blank is the message from David. The message from David. And chat, uh, verse 1 reads, One day David asked, Is anyone in Saul's family still alive? Anyone whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? So what is the message from David? In that verse, what is the message from David? Okay. They say... Uh, David want to know if there's anyone in Saul's family that's still alive. That's the message from David. What and why do you think he was uh, asking this question? Give, give him the mic. He wanted to show kindness to the remaining member of um, Saul because, of his, because he died. So he wanted to show kindness to him. Praise God. He wants to show kindness to someone from Saul. Does it stand to reason for him to want to be kind to Saul? Y'all remember Saul was after him throwing swords and trying to kill him, running him all over the country and, and every place. Does that make sense to you? I think he wanted to uh, find someone because Jonathan saved his life on many occasions from Saul. Saul wanted to kill him and John, Jonathan made him go out in the field and hide. Praise God. Okay. Okay. I like that. I like that. And that's a lesson for all of us. She said she believed that he wanted to show kindness because of the way Saul treated him. I think one of our uh, questions today is what do we do to our enemies? We love our enemies regardless of how they treat us. And, you know, some people will despise you and hate you simply because they're jealous of you. That was Saul's case. He was jealous of David. David killed his, uh, uh, Saul killed his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And Saul couldn't stand the thought of somebody else being put in that place on the throne. So he was after David and, and uh, was chasing him all around. But I heard over here somebody say that he was asking this for Jonathan's sake. Because he and Jonathan had a special relationship. And you'll find in 1 Samuel chapter 20, the words of the uh, covenant that David and, and uh, Jonathan made. It says in verse 20, and thou shalt not only while yet I live show me the kindness of the Lord that I die not. But also thou shalt not cut off thy kindness from my house forever. So what uh, Jonathan was saying is that even though... I know that you're slated to be the next king, even though I know that you're, you know, me and your, uh, your, you and my daddy don't get along. Just promise me that you will show me kindness because remember what Jonathan was doing. Jonathan put his own life on the line for David because his daddy was mad that he was warning David and telling David what was going on and standing up for David, defending David. And all of that. So Jonathan put his life on the line. And all he asked in return is to say, when you get in that position, remember me and all of my descendants forever and ever. And they, they made a covenant. David swore that he would take care of him. But how many people know that sometimes people will make you promises and they'll forget about what they promised you? It can be years later. And in this case, it was many years later because remember... Jonathan and Saul went out to war, and they were killed in the war. And Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son, was only five years old when this happened. I did a little research, and it appears that Mephibosheth was about 25 or 30 when David uh, called to bring him to the house. So sometimes you may think people forgot about you. You may think the promise is dead and nobody's going to look after you. But David did not forget what he had promised Jonathan. So that is the message from David. The message is, I want to find somebody from Saul's family that's still alive whom I can show kindness to, not for Saul's sake, but for Jonathan's sake. Um, the second blank is the meeting 
with David, which is verses 2 through 4. He summoned a man named Ziba. And as I listen to this online, some say Ziba, some say Ziba. It doesn't matter. Tomato, tomato is all the same. Y'all know who we're talking about, right? He summoned a man named Ziba who had been one of Saul's servants. Are you Ziba? The king asked. Yes, sir, I am, Ziba replied. The king then asked him, is anyone still alive from Saul's family? If so, I want to show God's kindness to them. Ziba replied, yes, one of Jonathan's sons is still alive. He is crippled in both feet. Where is he, the king asked. In Lodabar, Ziba told him, at the home of Makar, son of Amiel. And uh, this is where David found out where he was. This was a meeting with Ziba to find out uh, where this child was. And he was hiding in Lodabar. Anybody have a guess as to why Mephibosheth was hidden? You say because he was the only son of Jonathan. He was the, he was the only son of Jonathan. And the, his grandfather, like you had said earlier, they were enemies of David. Yes. So he was hiding, thinking there's going to be a lot of retribution against him. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that answer. And uh, let us remember what the scripture said about when David, and, I mean, when Saul and Jonathan died, the nurse thought that uh Mephibosheth would be in danger so she picked him up he's five years old mind you picked him up and start running as she dropped him and that's how he became lame in both of his feet all of us have had a time in our life where somebody dropped us where we needed help but somebody wasn't there things happen in life sometimes our fault sometimes not our fault but uh uh, Mephibosheth was dropped and they was trying to hide him because like the sister said if, uh, back then the kingship went from generation to generation and because Jonathan and Saul was dead, Jonathan's son would be the next king so they had to get him out of harm's way even at five years old if you read the history of Israel some people took kingship at eight years old seven years old, different ages, so it wasn't uncommon for someone that young to be put in the position of being the king. So uh, they got him, and they went to a place called Lodabar. Now, Lodabar means no pasture. It was a place where they, it was a poor place, a place where they call it nothingness. Remember what they said about Jesus? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? You know, some of us are from places that people look at like, that's where you're from? And as I thought about this, I said, I'm not going to name no place here in Georgia because I'm liable to hit somebody's city. And then I'm going to get eggs thrown at me. So I ain't going to call no cities. But I'm going to tell you, we were from a place, my brother's here, they know, my sister-in-law, a place called Pagolaville. In Pagolaville, there was one way in and one way out. We had little sugar shacks, four-room houses out there. And people looked at us like we were inferior because, you know, you come from nothing, nothingness. However, God got a way to take nothing and turn it into something and change things around. And this is what this lesson is all about because David gave favor to Mephibosheth. And at the end, you'll see how he was able to come out of Lodabar and sit at the king's table. And we, as children of God, we have the privilege of coming out of nothingness and sitting at the king's table. Every first Sunday when we take communion, we're sitting at the king's table. Our lives have been eternally changed for the better because of our uh, relationship with God. Hallelujah. So the meeting with David was when Ziba came and told him that uh, Saul's son was still alive, but he was crippled in both feet. And all David said is, where is he? He did not say, you know, well, I, I, 
how is he doing or, or, you know, is he able to do anything? He just said, where is he? He wanted to uh, bless Mephibosheth. Our third uh, uh, point or breakdown for the introduction is the mercy of David. David sent for him and brought him from Macaw's house and his name Mephibosheth uh, he, he, originally, he was Merib Meribel, which means a, a striver against Baal. And he was later called Mephibosheth, which means shameful. He was Jonathan's son and Saul's grandson. When he came to David, he bowed low to the ground in deep respect. David said, greetings, Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth replied, I am your servant. Remember when David first came into the presence of Saul? He declared himself the servant of Saul. And one thing about life, there's a, a law of reciprocity that goes around. If you show respect, you'll get respect. If you good to other people, somebody will be good to you. We grew up in a church with a pastor who you, uh, used to say, uh, if you're concerned about somebody, somebody be concerned about you. And we have to be mindful. We're talking about prioritizing hurting people. So we have to show that concern for somebody else in order to, when we're down, because some of us is one paycheck away from homelessness. Some of us are in trouble financially in different areas or whatever. So you never know when you're going to need somebody. Praise God. He's... Uh, he, uh, Mephibosheth replied, I am your servant. And David said, don't be afraid. Why did he have to say that? Okay. They, they, you don't have to run, John. We heard her. She said, because they thought somebody would try to kill him because of his status, because he was the grandson of King Saul. And it was rightfully so. But in the New Testament, there's many times that people encountered angels. And the first thing they said to them is, be not afraid. Be not afraid. When God is in it, you can be not afraid because he got something good for you. He's looking to prosper you and to bless you. But sometimes we get fr frightful because we don't know what the outcome is going to be. He said, I intend to show kindness to you because of my promise to your father, uh, grandfather, father and grandfather Saul, and you will eat here with me at the king's table. And when Mephibosheth heard this, he, re he bowed respectfully and exclaimed, who is your servant that you should show such kindness to a dead dog like me? Mephibosheth thought so little of himself, and this brought my mind back to when David was running from Saul. There was a time when Saul, when David referred to himself as a dead dog to say, why are you, why are you out here running after me? Am I a dead dog or whatever? So a lot of reflections are coming back to David as he's dealing with this situation. Being called servant, having somebody say, I I'm not even worthy of you doing what you're doing for me. And that's the state of us before Christ. When we fall, when we have failed, uh, because of Adam, we all fell. We were a nothingness. We were nobody. But when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we become a king's kid. We are somebody. We're not dead dogs. Even when you remember the story, the woman who came and she wanted the crumbs from the uh, master's table. And uh, she would, uh, the master said, this is not for you. It's for the Israelites. And she said, even the dogs get the crumbs from the master table. So, you know, sometimes you might not think so highly of yourself, but nevertheless, God is still in the blessing business. In 1 Samuel 24, 14, that's when, uh, uh, when David referred to himself as a dog. Then the king summoned servant Zeba and said, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. Isn't that awesome? The years that the canker worm has eaten, the things that the devil has taken from you, when God get ready to bless you, he'll give it all back to you. He'll return it to you. 
He said, you and your sons and servants are to farm, farm the land for him to produce food for your master's household. So in other words, he gave Mephibosheth all the land, but he had somebody else working the land to uh, bless him. That's blessing. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, will eat here at my table. And they say Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants, so they had plenty of labor, plenty of people to do the work to take care of the land that was given to Mephibosheth, and Mephibosheth didn't even have to sit there to eat. And remember, Mephibosheth was lame in his feet. So he's sitting at the master's table, and everything is covered. You can't tell that he even have a problem. And that's the blessing of God. When we give our life over to him, when we trust him, we sit at the master's table and people don't know nothing about your past because your past is behind you. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. We're new in Christ. And that's the blessings of the Lord. But Mephibosheth, your master, will eat at my table. And Ziba replied, yes, my lord, the king. Now, Ziba is referring to David as his lord. He was the servant of Saul. He said, I am your servant, and I will do all that you have commanded. And from that time on, Mephibosheth ate regularly at David's table. Like one of the king's own sons, Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah. So, you know, when we are in Christ, we become the child of God. When we do added members, pastor asks the question, is everybody a child of God? Anybody say yes? Raise your hand. Is everybody a child of God? Okay. Why do you say yes? Somebody that said yes. Why do you say yes? Everybody's a child of God. We got a hand over here. Pastor, this is added members. She says she's a child of God because once she's accepted into the kingdom, she is a child of God. But what, what about people who were not accepted into the kingdom? I got a hand over here. Is everybody... There you have it. There you have it. She said we are all creations of God, but not everybody is a child of God. To be a child of God, you have to uh, accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And we want to be sure and very sure about that. Thank you. So we're not all children of God until we accept Jesus Christ. Uh, he was crippled in both feet, and he lived in Jerusalem and ate regularly at the king's table. And David wasted no time sending for him in Lodabar. So um, that's going to go to one of our points later, so I'm not going to get into it. But like I said, I did a little bit of research because I wanted to be sure of the timing on uh, how old Mephibosheth might have been when all of this took place because we found out that when you're reading the Bible, you can read something in chapter 2 and then go to chapter 6 and read something else happening. And between chapter 2 and chapter 6 could have been decades. A whole lot of years could have passed. And that is the case in this situation. First of all, we knew that Mephibosheth was five years old when Saul and Jonathan died. He was five. And you find that in 2 Samuel 4 and 4. Saul and Jonathan died in 1078 BCE. That's before Christ, 1078. David became king over all of Israel in 1070. So you already got five years added to, uh, uh, eight years added to those five years. So that makes him 13 already. David's 37 years old at the time when he became king. And Mephibosheth uh, when David became king over all Israel, David invites Mephibosheth to visit him at his place a short time before he meets Bathsheba. And David was probably around 50 years old when he met Bathsheba. So Mephibosheth was probably around 20 to 25 years old. So he's been in this state of being for over 20 years. He's been crippled. He's been in Lodabar. He's been in uh, nothing in this city. He's been living low. But when God touched your life, hallelujah, everything can turn around. Amen. And this is what happened Amen. for Mephibosheth. So we have five blanks that we need to fill in. 
And uh, I'm going to give all five of them to you, and then I'm going to go back and give you some information. The first blank is interest. I'm not talking about your money in the bank. No, I'm talking about interest. You got to be interested. Interest. The second blank is intent. Notice they all start with an I-N. The third blank is investigation. The fourth blank is initiative. And the last blank is investments. So we're going to go back to the first blank. The first blank is interest. Interest help believers to prioritize hurting people. If you show some interest. I was just sharing with my niece and talking about this the other day about how we have a tendency when we go to the store, we see somebody sitting over there with a cup asking for money. And we don't show any interest in what's going on in their life. We just pull out a $10 bill, $5 bill, whatever, put it in the cup and leave it there. But have you ever thought that maybe that person need Jesus more than they need that money? Have you ever thought that maybe they need a conversation? Maybe they need somebody to show some interest in them because everybody got a story. Everybody is in the condition they're in because of things that happen in their life. So if we want to prioritize hurting people, we need to take time and show a little bit of interest. And I cautioned her, because of the time we're living in, your interest should not evolve to the point on a cold day to say, oh, come on, I want to hear your story. Come sit in my car with me. And... <laughs> that's not the kind of interest we're talking about you can stand if he's been standing out there for three hours in the cold five minutes you standing out there talking to him is not going to freeze you to death it's okay but we got to learn to show some interest that'll go a lot further for some people than just handing them a dollar bill what they really need is Jesus and if you start listening to their story, a lot of people tell you, well, I used to be saved. No, 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 baby. Used to be ain't the case. Because once you're saved, you're always saved. You may fall out of grace. You may stop doing the things that make you feel bold and go before the throne of grace. But if you were saved, if you were truly saved and born again, and it's just like I have children. And I don't care how bad they are, I don't care what they do, they're going to be my children for the rest of our lives. You don't stop being a child of God just because you messed up. If that was the case, we'll all be in trouble. Hello, somebody. <laughs> but uh, we, we have to give them time, show some interest, and uh, help them to understand that in spite of whatever they've been through, whatever, wherever they're at, that Jesus made a promise that if you accept me and, and do what I tell you to do, I will bless you. Bless you going in, bless you coming out, bless you in the city, bless you in the field. All of your household will be blessed. We have to learn how to give them what really matters, and that's Jesus. Amen. Give them something tangible, too, now. Don't be one of those stingy Christians. You just tell them, let me pray for you, and then you leave them in the state they're in. No, show some interest and give a little of your interest out of your bank account. Amen? Amen. We have to show some interest. In first, uh, verse 1, David asks, is anyone still left in Saul's family? That was showing interest. He was interested to carry out the covenant that he made with Jonathan many, many years ago. The second pointer is intent. What does that mean? What is intent? Somebody said purpose. Absolutely. It's the purpose. We must watch our motives. We must understand why we're doing what we're doing. So if you're standing there and somebody's sitting there with a cup and you pull something out just to be seen of man, the Bible says you got your reward already. 
What is your intent? What is your purpose? And David purposed in his heart to fulfill the covenant and to bless, the, bless him as God would bless him. Now remember, David was a man of war. And it's no wonder Mephibosheth was kind of scared when he first heard that David wanted to see him because he knew what David could do if he chose to. But David's intent was holy. David's intent was right. He said, I want to show kindness to that person for Jonathan's sake. So let us watch our motives. Let us watch our purpose. Whatever we're doing, we need to do it as unto God to, so that God will be glorified. Doesn't matter who get the credit, long as God get the glory. The third one, and we're going to get out of here early, y'all, is investigation. Investigation is the search for truth or facts about something. You need to investigate. I had a situation happen to me, I uh, guess about a year ago now. I was at Sam's Club, and uh, a young man was telling me his sob story that just pulled on my heartstrings, and I felt led of God to give him a substantial amount of money. I just, you know, you give me your cash app, I'm going to send you the money. And I felt fine about that, until later, he had the nerve to text me and ask me for some more. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Do you really have a problem or you just want to use people? And uh, the Lord put it on my heart. That's it. Cut it off. Nothing more is necessary. But we have to investigate a little bit. Not everybody that got that cup out is worthy of being given whatever. You got to search your heart and search your intent and know that the spirit of God is leading you to do whatever it is that you decide to do for that person. And when God say no, because some people are in the shape they're in because of their own bad choices or whatever. Sometimes God is wanting to deal directly with that person and we get in the way trying to help somebody that God want to deal with directly. Amen. Amen. I know I'm right. So we have to be discerning. We have to mature like the master. We have to have the wisdom to know when to hold them, when to fold them, when to run, and when to walk away. We need the wisdom. So we have to do the investigation. And uh, investigation can help believers to prioritize hurting people. The next one is initiative. Initiative can help believers to prioritize hurting people. It said, then David had servants bring Jonathan from the house of Makor, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. So what this is saying is that David took the initiative to ask to have uh, Mephibosheth brought to him. Can you imagine how the story may have went if he would have just said, oh, tell Mephibosheth, uh, I'm, I'm the friend of his daddy, and uh, when he get a chance, tell him to come see me. He'll probably still be sitting there. David took the initiative, and we as Christians, sometimes we got to take the initiative. When God lays somebody on our heart, when God give us something to do, take the initiative. Don't sit back. David wasted no time sending for Mephibosheth because he knew what he wanted to do he had to bust the first move what are you waiting for God already spoke to you about it many times what are you waiting for you have to prioritize hurting people I asked up front do anybody know anybody who's hurting and I saw a few hands go up we need to prioritize those people and our last blank is investments. Oh, no, the devil ain't. Is investments. To invest is to put something in. Sometimes we have a tendency. We don't put nothing in something, but we be looking for something out. We tell folks, you know, I'm going to pay you back when my ship come in. We ain't never sent none out. Watch those people. 
Judge Mathis said, don't let them tell you they're going to pay you when they get their income tax. <laughs> Sometimes we, we have to make the investment. And when we make whatever we do for the least of them, the Bible says we do also unto him. We're investing in the kingdom. We're investing in God's business when we help somebody who is hurting. Uh, my late husband used to say all the time, you don't, you, you don't lose nothing by that. He said, he tells us, let's do this, let's do that. We ain't going to lose nothing by that. And we got to take that mindset because we are super blessed. God has brought us from a mighty long ways, and we have uh, more than enough to do what we need to do, and we ought to be of the mindset that we're going to bless somebody else. We're going to help somebody else, not just me, mine, us four, no more, but we want to bless somebody. So if we want to mature like the master, we have to be willing to prioritize people. And I said earlier, and I'll say it again, we have to love people and use things rather than using people and loving things. We want to mature like the master and help others uh, come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, which I don't know, I'm sure it's in the announcements, but I'm going to bring it up right here and now. Uh, this is Valentine's Day coming up, and we want to uh, go out and do some um, witnessing. And this is a great time to show how we prioritize people. Yeah, I know your favorite show is coming on. I know you got something on the stove. I know you got this and that. But how about laying aside what you want to do for a minute and go out there and help to help hurting people? There's plenty of them out there. The main thing we want to do is tell them about the love of God. Tell them about Jesus Christ hurting people. So what we're going to do, and I'm not going to tarry just because we got more time, is uh, we're going to share our information about our offering. Y'all ready for this? Y'all ready? Last week's offering was... 90,000. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. Ain't God good? Ain't God good? God just keep on blessing and blessing. The more he, we give, the more he give to us, and we're able to give more and more back to the kingdom. Amen. It's a blessing. Amen. It's a blessing. Uh, before we go any further, we want to extend an opportunity for anybody who uh, don't know... Uh, Jesus as in the part of their sin, uh, you may be online, you may be here in the house. And if you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we're here to receive you, to tell you about the ABCs of salvation. If you're online, you can text uh, SAVE to 678-681, 661, I'm sorry, 5180. Or if you want to join Berean, I don't care if you're living on the other side of the country, you can still be a member of Berean by proxy. Text JOIN to 678-661-5180. Or if you just need prayer, we have ministers here that will pray with you and pray for you. And if you're online, you can text PRAYER to 678 661-5180. Amen. So um, at this time, we're going to prepare to receive our offering, and we're going to pray you out. Um, but before we do, let me give you the announcements. Saturday, February 10th, is a baby dedication and baptismal class at 10 a.m. on Zoom. If you desire your baby to be dedicated or you desire to be baptized or you know anyone for baptism, there's a Zoom class Saturday, February 10th on Zoom at 10 a.m. On that same day is our evangelism outing. As I said earlier, we want to be about our father's business all we have to do is show up and we're going to go out and give Valentine uh, messages out to ask people to let Jesus be their Valentine. Or also on February 10th, we are a busy church. On that same day, we have nursery 
ministry meeting at 10 a.m. in room 104. And we also have CPR, AED, first aid training at 9 o'clock in the overflow. So uh, on that same day, Benicia Johnson's dad's funeral is in Tucker uh, at 1 p.m. So uh, I assume she's one of our sisters, one of our cousins, and those that are able to go there to support, let us show the love, uh, making people a priority, especially hurting people. You know, when we lose a loved one, we're hurting. So make that a priority. On Sunday, February 11th, is the Bible Bowl All Services. Get your scripture ready. If you were here last Sunday, you saw what went down. People was battling in the Bible Bowl. I mean, scriptures coming from over here where the men talking about the women and the women jumping up over here, giving something back to the men. Get your scripture ready so that you'll be able to uh, do what you need to do for the Bible Bowl. And on February 11th, the G-Men have a Super Bowl party at 6 p.m. That's on Sunday, same day, 6 o'clock. On that same day is added members orientation at 2 p.m. Now, if you're here, you could have been a member for the last 10 years. If you've never went through added members class, we're asking you to please sign up. The information there is so vital and so important. You learn more about the church that you're worshiping in. Learn how to get connected with different ministries. Uh, learn about the passions of pastor's heart. So those are our announcements. And uh, we're going to pray. And I ask you to remain seated until dismissed. Amen. Father God, we come before you. We thank you for your word, oh God. We thank you, God, that you have encouraged us to prioritize hurting people. Father, we pray that you will just help us to be more sensitive to people around us, who's hurting and what they need, and we will acknowledge you in all our ways, oh God, that you might direct our path, that we'll be about our Father's business, oh God. And Father, even as we prepare to receive an offering, we thank you for the 90000 that has already been given on last week. And Father, we thank you that those that are here that are ready to give, Father, we pray that you will bless them, restore to them 10 20, 100 fold from that which they are given in this offering, oh God. So, Father, we thank you for all this, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.